The clinical features of visual snow syndrome consist of the visual snow, which is continuous, dynamic, tiny dots in the entire visual field. And the syndrome adds in two additional features from palinopsia, after images or trailing, and toptic phenomena, photophobia or impaired night vision. Visual snow was first described in a paper by Liu and colleagues in neurology in 1995. Three patients, in fact, used the word snow and they compared the appearance to that of an untuned black and white television. We became convinced of the reality of the problem, if you like, when we saw a 12-year-old girl and described it in 2013 who had all of the features and clearly was troubled by the problem. The prevalence of visual snow has just been reported at the, uh, at the EAN meeting with a web-based study that looked at patients distributed in the community and asked questions about vision and some control questions, for, exact, for example, about uh, diabetes. They found of 1,000 patients, just over 1,000 patients, that 3.7% had visual snow, the continuous dots, and 2.2% had visual snow syndrome. The uh, mean age was 50, and the female to male ratio is 1.6 to 1. This compares to the kind of data that we've seen in terms of comorbidities, where the population has about 55% of headache and tinnitus 59%, with a, with a clinic-based uh, population that we published a little bit earlier in the year in neurology. The other thing which has emerged at the EAN is that the symptoms are relatively constant over time. The paper by Graber and et al. demonstrated re-interviewing a cohort from 2011 and 12 in 2018-19, the density um, and velocity of the, visual, of the visual snow itself was unchanged completely in over 80%. Visual snow syndrome is a relatively new condition in terms of its investigation. Most important contributions to pathophysiology, I think, have come from brain imaging. And we've just seen at the uh, EAN meeting a paper from Paletta and et al. looking at resting state functional connectivity comparing patients with visual snow syndrome and controls. They compared them at rest and then gave them a task, indeed a task where they would have a, a, the visual, a visual snow appearance, if you like, an untuned television um, appearing in the visual field. Seeding visual areas, V1, motion area, V5, the lingual cortex, which has been implicated previously, cerebellum, pulvinar, precuneus, anterior insular and the posterior cingulate cortex, there was altered connectivity between V1 and V5, so visual, uh, visual motion and primary visual cortex, the thalamus and basal ganglia with the lingual cortex and the visual motion area with the default mode and attentional networks. The pathophysiology of visual snow syndrome clearly resides in the brain. The diagnosis of visual snow syndrome is entirely clinical, taking a very good history, characterising the symptomatology, and then examining the nervous system, including careful examination of the eyes, and where appropriate, a slit lamp examination by an ophthalmologist. Perhaps the biggest lacuna we have in visual snow at the moment is that there aren't any universally effective treatments. In fact, there are no, uh, no treatments that are particularly effective at all. And this is a yawning gap. Research is focusing on understanding the biology using functional imaging and electrophysiology techniques and trying to understand the pharmacology behind that so that we can start to develop new therapies. <laughs>